All right, so welcome to the guide on understanding boost compression fuel and spark. So what we're going to be going over today is actually kind of like taking a sip from a fire hose. It's going to be a lot of stuff, but it's all base knowledge that you should understand prior to tuning in any of these things. Um, you should definitely have a good understanding of what's going on inside the engine. Because we're getting a little more advanced with the tuning here, I'm going to go ahead and start throwing in these disclaimers. This is starting to going to get a little more dangerous uh, in the... Uh, uh, the effects it could have on your engine. So the inf information contained in this video is for educational purposes only. Any modifications and tuning of engines can have undesirable consequences if done improperly. Uh, before attempting any modification, please do your own research or consult a professional. This video will focus gener on generally accepted practices. This uh, emphasis on the word generally. Um, however, uh, may not apply to all builds out there, and that's uh, my point here. Um, Boost is incredibly unforgiving, uh, so is Spark and some other things, so always err on the low side and keep it conservative. Uh, failing to do so is at your own risk. Um, so uh, without further ado, we'll get into the video. So here's what we're going to go over today. Uh, we're going to cover pressure and boost, uh, basically the, uh, the physics behind that. Uh, we'll go through compression, how that works, all the definitions. Um, we'll cover detonation, pre-ignition, um, and some fixes and remedies for this. Um, of course, fuel types and octane rating is going to play right into all of it. Uh, so, and that goes into fuel delivery, which gets into spark plug selection and reading. And then we'll uh, cover some other considerations at the end, uh, some particular sensors and some little uh, little things that you may have you may run into. Um, but that's pretty much it. That's what we're going to go over today. All right. So pressure and boost. So the overview of this little section, we're going to go over pressure, what that is, um, boost, and then types of boost. Uh, so we'll cover types of blowers um, and basically the pros and cons of each one. Alright, so pressure. On a naturally aspirated engine, the amount of air that enters the engine is limited to the amount of air pressure present in the atmosphere. Atmospheric pressure is also known as barometric pressure or BAR for short. Uh, so if you ever heard one bar, two bar, that's where that comes from. Um, BAR is measured as a column of air extending to space, uh, so all the air above you. The weight at the bottom of this column of air or BAR is equal to the approximately 14.7 psi or about 101.3 kpa at sea level on an na engine cannot exceed the barometric pressure you just can't do it um, it's physically impossible in the manifold the pressure will always be less than barometric if you had more pressure in the manifold um, um, the engine would cease to run it just wouldn't pull in air um, which actually not pulling it in as we'll discuss here in a second. This difference is what actually causes the air to flow into the engine for to is vacuum. Engines do not suck in air. Uh, the reality is the engine actually creates a low pressure um, and then the atmosphere actually pu pushes itself in through the intake track. So uh, less restrictions equal more airflow. So uh, that's why we put on cold air intakes and do all that other modifications to our, um, to our airflow. So uh, that's how it's actually, what's actually happening. All right, so boost. Um, because air is compressible, uh, we can compress it, the existing air and force it into the engine uh, above, well above the barometric pressure. It's also known as forced induction. Uh, other ways to think of it is uh, we're blowing the air in. Hence, blower is a popular term for a supercharger. Uh, all designs of forced induction are essentially, essentially air compressors, um, and they only vary based on their operation. They all do the same thing. Um, the term boost refers to the amount of air pressure over the barometric pressure. At sea level, uh, 101.3 kPa is average one bar. At 110 kPa at sea level, the engine is now 8.7 kPa over the atmospheric pressure, or 8.7 into boost. Uh, one psi is equivalent to approximately 6.9 kPa. This would mean that there are 1.26 uh, psi into boost at sea level, um, but at 8,000 feet, that would be the same 30 uh, if, at the same pressure you'd have a 35 kPa into boost or 5 psi at the same map value of 110 um, if that makes sense because the atmospheric has dropped considerably um, the um, higher the altitude the less atmosphere think of the bar is uh, actually getting shorter above you uh, so there's less air above you uh, therefore less physical air to push into you and create pressure um, very rough general rule is for about 8,000 feet um, you're gonna drop about 25 kPa depending on a variety of other things like wind heat, sun, um, there's a lot of things that actually uh, change pressure. Um, and we're not going to get into weather systems right now, but uh, think of it like that. Um, a lot of There's a lot of things that go into that uh, number. But uh, to keep it simple, we'll just go with the 25. Alright, so here's a uh, picture uh, depicting actually what's going on. So if we look at this bar, we see that from the top, all, let's say if it goes, this goes all the way to the top, 
the total bar at the bottom, the weight is going to be 14.7 PSI, 101.3 kPa. Um, and that's at the st standard temperature of 15 degrees Celsius, which is also 288 Kelvin. Now, if we move that up to 8,000 feet, um, we only have 10.9 PSI, um, from the weight of the molecules above me here, we're going to have 73.75.3 uh, uh, kPa at 8,000 feet, same temp. So you can see that altitude changes the barometric pressure considerably. All right, so types of boost we're going to go over real quick is you um, going to have the positive displacement supercharges, probably um, the more well-known ones out there. Um, see these sticking out of the hoods of lots of old muscle cars. Uh, we'll go through the centrifugal. Uh, you get your superchargers, uh, version, uh, belt-driven. Then your turbochargers, basically the same thing, both centrifugal super, um, centrifugal blowers, I know we should say. Um, and of course, uh, there is electric out there now, uh, and, and some companies are working on that, but I'm really just not going to go over that right now. Just know it's a thing. And uh, the last thing, uh, we will compare uh, the two popular uh, versions um, to each other and see uh, see uh, what that looks like on a, uh, a boost curve and all that and how it does for power. All right, so positive displacement superchargers are essentially a large air compressor on top of the engine that's always running. Uh, so roots and twin screw blowers are positive displacement blowers. They create boost by spinning impellers in the intake cavity, uh, creates higher pressure on the discharge side. Boost pressure is consistent um, throughout the RPM band, so the airflow is essentially uh, linked directly to the RPM. So APSI at 3K is uh, 3,000 RPM is uh, you know X amount of air. At 6K, it's just gonna, at the same PSI, it's going to be double the air. So every basically, uh, so as the RPM doubles, so does the airflow. So it's very linear in a uh, um, in operation. So PD blowers make the engine simply feel like a bigger engine with their linear boost pressure. So uh, we'll see what that curve looks like here shortly. Uh, pros, um, the boost is available throughout the RPM range, instant throttle response. Even at idle, you're making boost. Um, even a little, but you're still going to make, just off idle, you're going to make a good boost. Uh, consistent, even boost curve, so we'll not gain or lose much off the curve, so it's very predictable. Um, and then, of course, they look pretty damn cool. i got to throw that in, because they really do. Sticking out the hood and all that, everybody loves that look. Um, cons, uh, since they're belt-driven, uh, they actually have a significant amount of efficiency loss from uh, parasitic uh, drag from the belt so that's something to keep in mind um, they're loud um, but I per personally I prefer that so I like the sound I love how they sound but um less potential power uh, than the centrifugal uh, blowers at higher rpm so you will see actually how that curve works because uh, because it's a fixed psi um, it'll actually produce slightly less power at higher rpm depending on how hard you, how hard you push that uh, red line um, then of course they're big and heavy so they're they're very large if you don't feel like cutting a hole in your hood um, probably not the way to go um, on the centrifugal or versus centrifugal blowers all right here so uh, we have our examples of some positive displacement blowers um, you know we got our whipple over here and uh, you know normal uh, Edelbrock etc so we get get the idea on uh, what they look like and they do look pretty damn cool if you ask me all right moving on to centrifugal blowers so there are two distinct types of centrifugal blowers. We have the centrifugal supercharger and the turbo. Both are um, both operate the same. They're both exactly the same. They they spin an impeller extremely high speed, um, which create uh, creates boost. Uh, these speeds can go well well over 50,000 RPM. It's, it's freaking crazy how fast these things can spin. Uh, so the only difference between uh, really between the two is how they work. So this like something like a pro charger, which is a centrifugal supercharger. Um, it will, uh, it's belt driven, it's, it's going to respond directly to RPM changes from the crankshaft. Turbos use exhaust gases, so that means that it takes a minute for that to actually spool up. Not really a minute, but it takes some time, uh, and this time is known as turbo lag. Uh, both are available with boost controllers, uh, as in adjustable boost, and uh, changing the angle of the impeller can adjust the boost curve and the amount of max boost, which is really cool, uh, something you can't really do on a, on a positive displacement blower. But, um, but as always, there are pros and cons to each of these. Uh, as we go over all these on the left, you have the belt driven here on the left and the turbo on the right. I think the biggest difference is uh, between the two, um, belt driven is a little more predictable on the boost curve. You have max PSI, max RPM. Turbo, not so much. This is going to be based on the size of the turbo, which is one of actually one of the pros of a turbo because um, you can pretty much put all kinds of different sizes on. Uh, depending and I uh, run those in sequential uh, little turbo than a big turbo or you can run twin turbos and run that's one of the huge advantages to having a turbo setup you can really go crazy with how much air you push um, cons to the turbo though is uh, probably the uh, hotter airflow um, because it is 
using exhaust, so you're gonna have some some heat coming off the turbo cell, so they get pretty hot. Uh, whereas the uh, Procharger does not get quite as hot, uh, so that's uh, there's one little drawback to this setup versus that. Uh, but pretty much um, over PD blowers, these uh, produce a very similar boost curve, so there's going to be a boost curve and not a linear uh, boost line. Uh, we'll take a look at that here in a little bit. All right, so uh, here's our our um, Procharger style on the left. We have our uh, belt driven supercharger and then we have over on the right we have our turbo as everyone's seen but they look pretty much identical to each other other than their operation as you see this has a belt and this one uses exhaust pretty much it um, so very simple uh, very simple small easy to, to, to install um, they're, they're easy to work into a lot of different combinations all right so let's compare the two on the on the pressure curve so here on the t on the red line we have our positive displacement blower showing starting around nine and a half psi um, peaking out about eleven and a half and coming back to, right down to about ten and a half uh, but you can see how linear that line is it's just kind of starting at because the rpm on the bottom at 2500 rpm it doesn't really gain or lose a whole lot of psi now you can see on the bottom on the blue line the uh, centrifugal blower uh, you see the line just kind of steadily climbs and actually exceeds that of the pd blower right at 6500 rpm it's going to start going uh, well actually before that it's going to be in the just before 6500 we'll be passing the uh, PD blower on actual boost pressure all right so what that does to power for us is uh, as you see the uh, red line again this is the uh, the power level of the uh, PD blower and then you see the uh, blue line centrifugal again and it, it actually surpasses starts making more power right after 5500 so you can actually see towards the top they do really well on the top end um, but the PD blower actually created a lot more power all the way up through um, that point, so uh, all the lower RPMs it's making more power uh, as expected. But uh, you can see where the uh, centrifugal is actually starting to exceed that of the PD blower uh, towards our high RPM, which is, uh, makes sense. All right, so now we're going to talk about compression. So compression in itself is how an engine can increase the efficiency of the power it makes through pressurizing the air fuel mixer. Uh, lower compression engines will produce less torque and horsepower than the same engine with high, more compression. This is because of the combustion process. Um, compression greatly uh, assists in this. Um, in every cycle except the power stroke, the engine must perform work uh, to drive the parts, uh, therefore reducing its efficiency. Uh, the power stroke must overcome and exceed all of the work that is put into the other cycles uh, to produce, produce net power. So. And essentially, the more we can compress the air, the more power the engine will make. However, um, this has limits. Uh, this definitely has some limits, and we cannot ignore them. Uh, so we'll go through all of them here shortly. All right, factors that affect the compression limits and pressure. So um, basically, the first one is going to be the compression ratio itself. So the swept displacement divided by the top dead center displacement will be covered more in detail shortly. Heat is going to be contributed to this uh, because it's going to add to the pressure because as air is compressed, it's going to increase in temperature, therefore increasing the pressure. Uh, fuel, um, fuel, all fuel types have different um, resistances to heat and pressure. This is typically referred to as an octane rating um, and or anti-knock index or, uh, or along those lines, uh, different fuels have different um, thresholds for uh, resistance to detonation. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk more on that later. Uh, ignition timing. Uh, more, more timing adds to the net pressure and can easily exceed the fuel type. So we have to make sure we keep that in check uh, and definitely uh, lean on the um, more conservative side for timing. Uh, timing will almost certainly cause detonation if it's uh, over advanced. Um, <coughs> boost level. Because compression causes heat, uh, boost only adds more. So it adds to the pressure on top of everything else and compounds on itself so we're adding uh, significantly more uh, heat and pressure in there uh, and lastly the material construction uh, itself so the different material different materials like um, versus iron and uh, aluminum so aluminum heads are actually going to um, have a little higher detonation tolerance because they're going to draw heat off faster they draw heat away quicker than the iron does the iron just uh, hangs on to the heat longer so uh, that, that's going to give us a little more, a um, little more uh, tolerance for uh, for boost. Um, so it's just going to help out a little bit. So that's uh, something else to consider. Uh, so we'll talk everything here a little more in detail shortly. All right. So compression ratios. Uh, there are several terms used in the definition of compression ratio. I'm sure you've seen static compression ratios, which is typically the one referenced by all car companies and uh, 
pretty much everything else. Um, every, you see this everywhere, uh, the static compression ratio, or SCR. Um, then you have the effective compression ratio, which is the ECR. This is easily um, easy to calculate and find out. Uh, we'll talk about that more. Um, dynamic compression ratio is another one you see a lot. And then of course uh, our boost compression or final compression ratio, and this is uh, going to be obviously um, with boost factored into the equation, um, and we'll talk about that more later. Okay, I know what you're thinking. Uh, static compression ratio, I'm sure everyone actually knows uh, something about this, but uh, we'll just cover it anyway. Um, so static compression ratio is all it is, is total sweat volume divided by the uh, t top dead center volume. Uh, so th there's a lot of parameters that are going to go into this uh, to determine what this actually is, um, but we're going to go with a uh, you just go through them real quick. We got the bore, we got the stroke, chamber volume, obviously. Um, piston design, uh, that's going to be plus or minus CC pistons, yeah, know that. Uh, dish, dome, flat top, or valve reliefs are going to dictate that design. Uh, and or if they add or subtract away from the volume at the top dead center. Uh, then of course, the head gasket bore and thickness, uh, same same thing, it adds to the volume. Um, so piston deck clearance, uh, in or out of the hole, pretty obvious uh, as to why, because it's also going to take away from TVC volume and or add to the bottom dead center. Um, based on red length and deck, deck height. Uh, so if it's in the hole, uh, it's going to add to the top dead center, if that makes sense. Uh, optional, but also increases in the accuracy. You get your ring depth and your uh, piston um, clearance in the bore, or the crown, basically edge to edge. You typically, you're gonna, uh, most pistons are going to be about 3,000 smaller than the bore. Um, if uh, you give a little bit of clearance on the walls. They can't be the exact same size, obviously. So uh, that, that actually is optional, but like I said, it gets very accurate if you need to do that. Um, this is uh, the primary ratio used in calculating boost compression, also known as final or boost, or some companies call it the effective ratio. Um, but we'll talk about that here in a sec, uh, actually what that really is. All right, so uh, here's a, a uh, vi more visual um, representation of SCR. So uh, this is uh, right before the compression strokes. This is what we're actually looking at is bottom dead center to top dead center from 540 to 720. So that would be the compression stroke. So during this, uh, right now in this position, the intake valve should be open on your engine and it's going to be well open um, because it's right at the end of the intake stroke, um, of course. So as the piston starts to come up, uh, basically the, um, we're going to measure uh, this total volume here um, versus the top as it gets to top dead center and that's all it is is this uh, volume divided by this volume and it gives us our static compression um, and we'll talk about why that's static here in a sec. Alright so let's move into the fun one we have the effective compression ratio um, this one is uh, defined as the amount of compression that occurs after the intake valve is closed so uh, because no camshaft closes the valve at bottom dead center this means that ECR will always be less than the static uh, so rod length and stroke play an important role in determining the ECR because uh, that means that it's going to change the position of the piston in the stroke. Uh, so the intake valve uh, close vent uh, is actually when we're going to uh, measure this from there to the top, uh, whatever's left. So um, the remaining amount is, uh, to top dead center is the ECR. Uh, now note that some companies still use the term ECR as calculation after boost is added into the equation. Uh, this can also be called boost compression or final compression I prefer to call the boost um, compression ratio, uh, boost compression or final compression ratio, which makes more sense to me because um, again defining this as uh, from intake valve close to the uh, top dead center which is the only effective amount of stroke that you have to compress. That does actually make sense. Uh, so anyway I uh, will uh, we'll get more into this here in a second. Alright, so this um, this relates to our tuning uh, in a few different ways. So we can we can adjust our effective compression ratio um, by advancing the camshaft. Um, this is going to cause the uh, valve to close sooner, uh, which means that it will increase the ECR. So advancing the cam increases the low end torque, but it also loses up top. But inc that's increased, and uh, retarding the cam will increase high end torque, uh, but it'll lose down low, and that's uh, decreasing the ECR. Um, more intake valve duration uh, later IVC gives them more tolerance for uh, you know basically for boost or other uh, lower octane fuel types because you're going to lower the ECR um, depending on that the length of that duration and when that valve closes uh, so here's a big thing is um, with variable valve timing uh, you have uh, or VCT in the Ford world um, you have uh, these things must be uh, been actually tuned throughout the uh, RPM band because you can actually advance and retard the cam while it's running, which is freaking crazy, but awesome uh, because you can have your cake and eat it too. Uh, 
but it does suck it does suck to do this but uh, you can actually mess around with the torque curve and uh, kind of get as much as you can out of that particular cam um, which is actually pretty neat that we can do that but uh, just keep in mind that that is what plays with the ECR and what creates that torque curve um, at the end of the day it's actually what adjusts uh, where it's going to peak and uh, where it's going to make the most power um, at what RPM so that, that's, uh, that's something to keep in mind so that's what effective compression ratio does for us um, and that's what this number really means all right, so I'm going to go ahead and recommend just using calculators for this. Um, I I could show you uh, the how the actual calculation, how to actually come up with it yourself, but I won't uh, for now to, for the sake of trying to keep this video as short as possible. Um, but anyway, uh, so you're going to need to know these uh, these values in addition to all your static values. So obviously we're going to need to know the intake valve close, the event, um, and if you can get it at 2000s or six. Um, or on the seat, even, it's even better. Uh, that's gonna that's gonna be required uh, to know uh, to get this right. And of course, uh, the rod length and the stroke. And I'll show you why that is uh, here in a sec. Um, the uh, recommended, I would say, uh, try not to go over 8.5 for 93 octane on that fuel. Um, can you go over it? Probably, uh, but not recommended. Uh, as I say, that's uh, general rule. Um, Tickle ranges uh, for this is 7.5 to 8.5. You see that pretty common for a higher performance engine. Um, stock is definitely not this high. All right, so here's our uh, visual um, representation of uh, effective compression ratio. So as we see, uh, the piston's starting to travel up uh, the the bore, and the intake valve is closed. It just closed, so we're going to assume that it just hit the seat. And uh, so the volume that's left is uh, from here to here is the effective compression ratio of the piston or of that cylinder. So this is going to um, be dictated uh, by a few other factors. So if we look down here, you see our little, I drew a little triangle here to demonstrate the uh, how rod length and stroke plays into this. Uh, so it actually becomes a trigonomic function uh, to actually determine the angles here. But just to remember the rod is basically in its uh, hypotenuse in a in a in a triangle. This is not a right angle triangle either, so it's not meant to be. Um, so the angle here is uh, would be your crank angle, so let's assume 80 degrees. You know, so let's say that's 80. That's why it's not 90. It could be, but um, normally it's not. Uh, so let's say just say that's uh, 80, and uh, that's and basically that means if I shorten the rod, um, that's going to bring the piston down in the bore, which will increase my effective compression because I'll have more space left. So shorter rods will uh, increase the ECR. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, so a longer rod will um, decrease it to some to some degree and that's going to be dictated on uh, actually how high your deck is and everything else. A lot of things go into this but uh, in as a general rule normally uh, reducing the rod length is, will absolutely increase the ECR so keep that in mind. Uh, so again, uh, the safe range is uh, 7.5 to 8.5. Uh, that's what we want to keep it to. Uh, so again, all depending on that camshaft and that valve event. So wherever th th this position is determined by that event right there. Now we can't cover compression ratios without talking about dynamic compression ratio because this term gets tossed around a lot. Now, technically, uh, this is actually a theoretical number. Um, dynamic compression ratio has a lot more to do with theory than it does uh, with actual uh, calculations. Uh, effective is cal you can calculate effective and you can calculate static. This number throws in another factor um, because things are moving. Uh, so this means that the compression is also going to have to do with the volumetric efficiency or the ability to move air. So as a like that ram air effect uh, that's going on as the piston actually exceed in increases in speed. So this we can't really predict this, um, not, not with calculating. Uh, it's very difficult to actually figure this out. Um, the actual, some calculators will still call it dynamic, but in reality it's more accurately referred to as, uh, as effective, um, technically, uh, unless VE is factored in. Uh, so the best way to get this ratio is actually uh, using special equipment. So they actually need like a flow bench to actually measure the legit measure everything going in and exactly what it's pressing it to. Um, so that's a, so just wanted to point that out that this is actually technically a theoretical number. Um, but uh, still used uh, out there in some websites and such. Uh, so it gets tossed around but I just want to clear that up. Alright, so the last one we're going to talk about is our boost compression, um, also known as the uh, final compression ratio. So this is uh, the ratio that after 
after boost has been added to the uh, equation. Um, now, the calculation I'm going to show you is going to use uh, static compression, so it's gonna, always going to err on the lower side uh, because uh, in, in all reality, some of it is going to be pushed back out the intake before the valve closes because, uh, as we saw, the intake valve is still wide open at, at the bottom dead center. So, we can't assume this, however. We can't assume how much uh, air gets pushed back out, and it's dangerous to make assumptions like that um, and goes directly, strictly from the effective because you may have more or less air in there based on a, a lot of other things. So, uh, we, we just won't do that. So, we're going to make the uh, some, we're going to error on the low side. Uh, that's, a, that's a good idea uh, to go ahead and just keep it um, to a lower. Um, a lower ratio uh, basically of actual airflow that's in there. Uh, of course uh, in reality there's going to be a lot of other things that play into this. Um, but a boost engine uh, with low static compression ratio can have the same effective compression of an equivalent NA engine with a much higher uh, static compression. So say a 12 to 1 uh, it can easily match by 7.5 static um, with 9 psi. It's so going to have the exact same uh, amount of uh, compression there. So the advantage of the boosted setup, however, is uh, the more airflow. So it's going to cool down more, it's going to get more fuel, uh, get more thermal efficiency, and there's a whole lot of good things to that. Uh, and it's just going to make more power. It, it, just, it will uh, make more power um, because of all of those factors. Um, and of course, uh, you're going to get better gas mileage at the end of the day um, while making more power. It's pretty good. More efficient engine. Uh, so that's actually pretty easy, uh, nice to note. Um, usually best to go lower uh, static and higher boost. Just a better way to go. Alright, so this is how we figure out our boost or um, final compression ratio. Uh, to calculate it, all we're going to do is um, take our boost PSI, we're going to divide that by the barometric PSI, so 14.7 is a typical number at sea level. Um, we're going to add one to that, and then we're going to multiply it by a static, and then it'll give us our uh, final number. Uh, so, at sea level with 8 PSI and a 7.7 .7 static compression ratio, it looks something like this. So we got 8 divided by that, uh, plus 1 times that equals 11.89. Imagine that. So uh, we're, what we're going to want to do is go ahead and keep our values under 12 to 1. Uh, that's, this is a very general number. So before you beat me up in the comments and say I've got this and that, uh, remember I'm keeping this general. So just think of your neighbor uh, strapping on a, you know, like your old, nice old lady strapping on a pair of twin turbos and she's asking you if she can run it on pump gas. I mean, this is kind of what, what are you really going to tell her. This is what I'm going to tell you, 12 to 1. So uh, keep it under that um, on aluminum heads and boost only, no air cooler. Obviously, you can make a, this number a lot bigger with uh, making a lot of other changes to your car. Uh, but generally, 12 to 1. Keep it under that number and you're fine. Uh, pump gas should run just fine on this uh, ratio. All right, so we can't really talk about heat and compression and boost without talking about detonation. This is what we're trying to prevent. So detonation is the auto ignition of a fuel mixture after the spark has already occurred. Normally fuel burns evenly in a single even pressure wave building across the piston. Chamber pressure will often reach 1000 to 1500 psi on race engines um, and any higher performance engines will be up in this range uh, depending on the compression and fuel type. Um, so when detonation occurs however this, uh, this even pressure wave becomes multiple pressure waves which uh, compound on themselves so basically uh, the, the, that even pressure wave gets shattered by other pressure waves. Uh, pressure can quickly reach undesirable levels over 2000 psi which can cause intense heat which that's more of the uh, problem here um, and potentially damages or destroys uh, high output engines 1.5 horsepower or up and that's per cubic inch. So mild night detonation is pretty typical on a stock engine um, stock output you know, under one horsepower per cubic inch. However under boost and high load modified engines there's no such thing as mild or light detonation. It should be taken very seriously and eliminated. Prevention is key. So, easy way to think this is the difference between pushing a piston down evenly with one push, like with your hand, like, or smacking it with a hammer repeatedly to achieve the same amount of movement. It's like pushing a car around with a sledgehammer. This produces a 6400 hertz sound. It's commonly referred to as knock or ping. The sound you hear is the piston rattling in the bore as it gets hit multiple times with high pressure waves. Uh, which also resonate through the block. Um, it's going to make a lot of noise uh, internally inside that cylinder and that will be picked up by the knock sensors which is uh, which are tuned to uh, 6400 Hertz. Um, so that's how that works. So uh, we'll, we'll take a look at some examples of, of what a normal pressure uh, wave looks like and what detonation pressure waves look like here in a sec. Alright here we have a normal pressure curve and uh, this particular engine um, is not a high performance motor but 
still shows the uh, appropriate curve here. So we see our, our effective compression start to build the pressure. The line is the pressure line. So the pressure is going up and it builds up to a little over 1600 kPa, which is uh, translates right on over to 232 psi. And noting that the that the uh, pressure actually doesn't peak out until after top dead center. That's pretty typical uh, because the ga gases are still lighting, expanding and pushing the piston back down. Um, and this is the, what ends up pushing the piston down. The pressure has to be after top dead center. This is why we um, that's why we light the uh, spark before um, top dead center so this has time to occur and we try to shoot for this peak to be just after top dead center so we get the best push back down the back down the cylinder so this is what normal looks like and then uh, we'll take a look at what detonation looks like here in a sec all right so here we have um, what detonation looks like uh, we got our black line up here is our pressure wave uh, as you see right here the detonation starts to happen and immediately you hit a spike in pressure and then up and down all the way back down as the piston starts to travel back down and as the flame front gets impacted by other flame fronts that are auto igniting off the edges of the cylinder so they're, they're coming in and hitting the flame front so this is what's going to cause this oscillation here so the pressure oscillation is going to jump up and down and this is what's going to resonate the block and essentially rock that piston in its bore um, and that's exactly what the knock sensors are listening for um, the other thing this is going to, going to cause is uh, the heat release rate is going to drop because the uh, amount of all of this going on, the oscillation and the pressure is going to add to the heat. So um, it's going to break down the natural barriers because uh, normally just heat going over something one time and staying hot for a short period of time is going to uh, dissipate heat quicker. Now if you keep hitting it, uh, it's going to break that layer down and it and eventually could melt the piston, could melt the spark plug, could uh, do damage to your valves, could do lots of uh, undesirable things in there and this has just caused from a little bit too much advance or a lean fuel mix and just too hot of cylinder temps, too much compression for the fuel type. So uh, that's something to note. This is what it all looks like, um, pretty much in a visual of what detonation actually looks like uh, using uh, pressure as an example, and as far as that goes. All right, so now we can talk about pre-ignitions. Um, as the name implies, this occurs before the spark ignites the mixer and can follow after a prolonged amount of detonation because detonation is going to add the heat. Heat is what's going to cause this. Um, heat will always cause this. Uh, so this is what um, basically is going to be caused by excess heat in the chamber. So it just said right here. Incorrect spark plug heat range, uh, things like that. Um, anything that can get hot enough to light the mix at any other point um, other than top dead center is considered something that can cause a pre-ignition. So spark plug is one of those things. You get the wrong heat range, they can get too hot and uh, cause a pre-ignition as well. So even a superheated valve lip uh, chamber surface, any of these can lead to this. Fortunately, since compression of a fuel mix can actually makes the mix harder to light, this means that pre-ignitions are most likely to occur near bottom dead center. Um, that means that it, if it does occur, it will be very catastrophic in nature. Uh, the piston will not simply stop and uh, it's going to be forced to compress the fireball for the duration of the stro stroke. Um, as you can imagine, this is, causes severe engine damage. I mean, this, this is really bad to have happen will likely melt parts from the immense heat uh, and uh, will carry the potential to crack a block, bend and break rods, lift heads, uh, host other really undesirable things to have happen to your engine. Don't want to have these, you want to prevent these. Uh, these are the thing to prevent and what will actually absolutely destroy an engine in a matter of milliseconds. Alright, so here's the uh, pressure wave during a pre-ignition event. So uh, even though it's uniform in nature, you don't see the oscillation, you do see how long the piston is exposed to the excess heat pressure and uh, essentially it's going to destroy this engine. It, it, it most likely destroyed this, uh, this, this test engine in the lab. Um, but this is, uh, this is what we're talking about. So as you see the ignition line here uh, happened, you know, again before top dead center, which is zero. You back off um, over 100 degrees, that's when the pressure started to build, but it lit right here um, before 100. So that's where the line spikes up. So this is where the intake valve close event, probably around here. So the intake was still even open at this point, most likely. Um, this would be the normal curve. And here's the pre-ignition curve. So it lit at near the bottom dead center, just like as advertised. Um, not a good thing. So as you see, it gets to uh, the peak pressure and the piston hasn't even hit top dead center, not even close. And as it hits top dead center, it's uh, actually um, well over 6,000 kPa so it's 
And this particular engine, if uh, you know, this this is probably not a performance engine. It's from the other one as well. It's operating normally at 200 and something. Well, now it's at 943. Um, and of course, the worst thing about this is the heat that it's going to produce. So if you notice the piston is being exposed to this amount of pressure for almost 100, it's over 100 degrees uh, of, of, of crank angle that it's being exposed to massive amounts of pressure and heat, which will melt things and, uh, and or break things. It might even just snap rods or uh, bend them. It's possible. Pre-ignitions are very, very bad things to have happen. All right, so now that I got your attention about detonation pre-ignition, or at least I hope I do, um, probably wondering how we avoid it. Well, uh, it's not that difficult. There's actually a lot of things we can do to avoid this. Um, so first off, we're going to uh, not exceed the compression limit of our fuel type. So running 87 octane on a 12 one motor is probably not a recommended thing to do. Uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, next, uh, we're going to make sure our air-fuel ratio is correct for whatever fuel type we are using. Uh, so also keep in mind, too rich can also lead to a two because it's going to build up some carbon. So you can uh, have some issues with uh, hot carbon in the in the cylinder as well. So um, too rich isn't always uh, it's better than being lean. I'll say that too rich is better than lean. Um, do not over advance the spark. This is a uh, pretty pretty normal. Uh, so the engine actually uh, uh, actually stops the knock is uh, pulling the spark out. So keep it conservative and uh, tune it after the AFR is correct. Don't ride the knock sensors. All right. So do uh, do not overheat the engine. Uh, heat contributes to the conditions that cause this. So the cooler you can keep it, the better. Um, use proper heat range spark plugs. Uh, I think I covered that one. Uh, do not exceed the boost limit for your fuel. Uh, this is relates to the compression and heat. So do the formula and make sure you're not too much in the boost uh, for whatever fuel you're using. Keep the IATs as low as possible. Uh, we'll cover a little bit of a few things you can do to do that a little later. Um, ensure a ch clean chamber. Uh, oil leaks can contribute to carbon buildup. Uh, it's pretty pretty typical. Um, <clears throat> of course, use uh, correct head gaskets uh, and uh, know the quench values because this is going to contribute to detonation as well. If you don't know what quench is, make sure you look that up when you're buying the head gaskets. Uh, it's very, very simple, uh, actually. Um, use the proper parts for your applications. Dome pistons are going to uh, be a little more sensitive to detonation. So that's pretty much a nice little list we can do of things that, that are going to help us avoid detonation and pre-ignition. So following this, so we should be fine uh, as long as we're keeping everything within the limits. We should be okay. All right, so fuel types and octane rating. So octane rating is essentially defined as the resistance to knock or de detonation or an anti-knock index, the AKI. The higher the number, the more resistant it is to detonation. A fuel with an AKI of 100 is technically 100% resistant to detonation. However, because this number is decided on a test engine compared to a test fuel, it do does not mean that it's immune to the conditions that could cause it in another engine in the real world with real conditions. Uh, so we're definitely going to push them a lot. Any engine is going to go a lot harder in the lab and you're going to see why. Um, pump gas with an AKA of 93 uh, would known, be known as 93 octane. This number is decided by a test in the laboratory. So basically this is going to be 93% um, resistant to knock uh, when compared to the test wheel. That's pretty much how that works. So we'll take a look at the, uh, how the test is conducted and, uh, just to get an idea of what we're, uh, what we're actually looking at when we see octane. All right, getting the octane rating is a result of an average of the research octane number, or the BRON, um, and the motor octane number, or the MON. Uh, in the United States, the formula is pretty simple. It's the RON plus the MON divided by 2. You're going to get an average. Uh, so the RON and MON are both calculated. Uh, same thing with a test fuel and a one-cylinder engine at fixed RPMs. The RON is a test uh, more more normal conditions. The MON is a, a lot more severe than the, the RON test. So if you're going to go for performance, uh, pick a better MON number. Like uh, The higher the MON, the better. So you look over here on the right, you see how it was tested. Um, you notice the note, the MON, the intake air temp, 149 degrees Celsius. It's uh, 100 degrees, almost a full 100 degrees over the uh, RON number. And of course, uh, if you take, take a look at the spark timing as well, they push it all the way to 26 degrees and um, advanced. And uh, you can see that that typically uh, is going to be a more strenuous test. It's uh, pretty clear um, as to why the better MON number is uh, better to use for performance. Uh, in other countries, this is actually a little different. Uh, so, uh, but this is how it is in the United States. This is what it, how it's calculated. All right, here on the left, I have a chart with uh, all the fuels listed. And then, of course, over here, the stoichiometric ratio, or the AFR, um, to one uh, of each of those fuel types. So um, gasoline, as we know, is 14.63 to about 14.7, somewhere in there, depending on, on the type of fuel and the additives, um, and so on and so forth down the list. I won't read them all off. 
but if we look over here on the right, um, I'm gonna, I want to note uh, that the lambda number, uh, if we go by lambda, we can use that for all the fuel types. It's pretty easy to use with different fuel types instead of saying 12.5 because that will not work with E85, for instance, because that'd be really lean for E85. So instead of saying that, we're just going to go with lambda, and we're going to say a lambda of 1 is equal to the stoichiometric ratio. So we have lambda of 1 would be 14.7 for gasoline. So that means a lambda of 0.85, that would be 85% of 14.7, becomes 12.49. So uh, I can do the same with the E85, set that to 9.7, 9 but with a lambda of 0.85, that becomes an 8.3. Uh, so that's why it's a little easier to use lambda for different fuel types. So I just wanted to cover that real quick. Uh, so the, the terminology makes sense and if you look at the bottom the lambda is a 0.85 and 0.78 are used for PE and BE respectively so 0.78 is a pretty common number for uh, power enrichment uh, or boost enrichment and uh, A5 is for power enrichment so pretty typical settings uh, for most fuels uh, shouldn't shouldn't do you too wrong there alright so we do have to talk a little bit about fuel delivery just this one slide though uh, so two primary considerations here are your uh, your injectors and your fuel pump. So those are the two things we gotta we gotta definitely take a look at if we're gonna boost something or mod highly modify an engine and uh, basically increase its airflow needs well beyond what it was intended to do. Uh, so that means we're gonna need new injectors and most likely a fuel pump because when you increase the size of the injectors, the fuel pump has to pump more volume and, and unfortunately the stock uh, pumps will run out of juice uh, in the higher RPM range and uh, will drop off on pressure. That is a bad thing. It can cause lean conditions and uh, cause very dangerous situations as uh, detonations and preignitions uh, may, may follow that. Um, here on the bottom, I'm talking about how to log injector duty cycle. This is for the Gen 3 crowd um, right here. If you need this formula, here it is. That's very simple to uh, make this, plug this into your scanner. You get injector pulse width, multiply that by RPM and divide it by 1200 and it's gonna give you the duty cycle. Uh, if, if it's not an optional uh, channel, like a, a lot of the Gen 3s, you can't just select injector duty cycle, unfortunately. So you just plug this in and it, and it works just fine. Um, and of course, the 1200, using 1200 as a value puts it into a percentage for you and look for numbers in this range, nothing over 100, because it's technically going to be beyond the uh, entire length of that stroke or how long the intake valve was even open. Right, here's some basic stuff on spark plugs. So we have the normal uh, plug look over here. Um, notice that it's uh, dull in color. It's not no, no shiny spots or anything like that. That means it's uh, got a good burn going. Uh, and uh, there's nothing uh, sticking to it or causing excess heat. Now if you look underneath of it, it's kind of the opposite. You actually see some shiny spots. You see uh, the porcelain's damaged and you see it melting around the uh, edge of the electrode right here. You see some melting going on. You also see bits of uh, piston and or um, other things on the uh, porcelain here and uh, know the threads are also cooked and uh, so you can tell that that got very overheated so it moves into uh, the next uh, we'll look at the carbon valve one uh, you see here definitely a very dark uh, running very very rich uh, and or it's got um, the beginnings of an oil leak you got some oil mist getting in there and causing some uh, of that to stick to the to the plug and burn off essentially it'll still be a little gooey but uh doesn't have that shine to it like a, a real leak guys just like this one. If you look underneath, uh, you see this one is oil valve. It's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty clear what's going on here. Uh, so you have uh, a bent valve, uh, maybe a valve seal, bad, um, bad piston rings, etc. Excess PCV, um, that kind of thing. Probably another uh, symptom of bad rings. Uh, so that that can blow oil up and or through the PCV as well from pressure getting into the crankcase. Then we go into this, uh, we have our spark plug selection and reading. So here's our, our master chart on the left, kind of gives an idea of everything um, you know, to look for on a spark plug. Um, it's a good one to go ahead and pause on and take a look at. Uh, you can look this up, it's all open source out there on Google. You can find any of this information yourself, uh, but very good information. I'm not gonna read all this stuff, but uh, kind of take a look over at the right. We see our heat range um, is indicated by this mark here and see the timing mark right behind it. It's right there. And so you see this little gap is our timing mark and heat range. So however far this goes is our heat range. So if it if the heat range makes it down to the base ring, um, that means it's way too hot. Um, the plug is way too hot. You can also see that the discoloration will occur on the threads down here. And we'll take a look at that. Um, right here, as you see, 
that's what's going on with that plug. So you see that here's the base ring. You can tell uh, this is where you're looking for the AFR ratio. Um, and you should look for something like a, a light brown color. That's, that's about the best you can see. Nothing black and it shouldn't be clean. Um, over here on the right, you see the base timing mark again, uh, that little mark there. Uh, base timing and you have your heat range and your total advance. So it's going to give this little mark strap here. Now when doing this test, if you're going to do this and try to get these plugs to tell you what the heat range is, uh, you have to use a brand new plug. Um, these have to be brand new and it can only be done on one run and you cannot uh, cannot let the car idle because it will throw the reading off. So what you do is uh, you get it down the track, you chop it, uh, chop the throttle um, right as you finish the run and just coast, uh, coast on down and or you can do that uh, on a dyno as well. Uh, but it's a plug chop and then uh, you go ahead and get towed back or whatever you got to do, get back to the pits, pull your plugs out, take a look, and uh, this is what you're going to see. Yeah, so what you're going to look for to test, uh, this is kind of a tuning tool. It's not the ultimate tuning tool, but it definitely tells, it's very, uh, it's pretty accurate. Um, and, and it's just a, a tool to help us uh, to get, it, get everything right. All right, so here um, through it a little bit about timing. Uh, so optimal timing occurs is what's known as uh, maximum brake torque or MBT. Uh, so this is um, the point at which light in the fuel mixture will produce the most pressure just past TDC. As you see TDC here, and again the pressure is still occurring well after TDC. Uh, so the best is, uh, this is best measured on a dyno. It's the only way you're going to know for sure if you're getting to this point uh, is on a dyno. Um, this also can be done at the track uh, using trap speed. So either way you can measure um, the power of your engine uh, based on these two things. It's still best on a dyno, it can still be done at the track, not really recommended anywhere else uh, to be perfectly honest. Uh, compression, heat, fuel type and boost uh, will determine the maximum amount you, that you can push this uh, but there's still a limit. If you push it too far it's to, it just won't, won't achieve what you want it to because it will move the peak too close to the top to the center, not exactly where you want it to be, you want it to still occur after top dead center and here is shown about 10 degrees 10 to 20 right here in this range 10 to 20 degrees at the at the peak pressure just after top dead center so that's a uh, that's good to note and this is kind of what you're looking for and the whole purpose of advancing and retarding spark is to find this sweet spot and uh, again best to do on a dyno or the track I'll, uh, I'll get into tune and spark another time but over advancing it will uh, cause detonation, and we know this. Uh, so pushing it too far will push this peak over towards and we'll end up with some de detonation going on. And uh, that's just not what we want. So and possibly, of course, that leak can lead to a pre-ignition. So we always go conservative on this. Uh, but I just wanted to show this little chart because I thought it was pretty good uh, showing MBT. All right, so a few last little things uh, to talk about real quick. If we're going to talk about boost, we've got to talk about map sensors. So when running boost, uh, you can't just run a one-bar sensor. You have to have to run a different um, map sensor. You're going to have to go up two-bar or three-bar. Um, it, it's something uh, you're gonna also going to may have to figure out the linear and offset values for the sensor you buy. Uh, it should come with the pressure values and voltages. Um, take those numbers. Uh, here's the formula down here to, to actually plug into the scanner if it's not already provided. You take max pressure, you minus minimum pressure, divide that by the max voltage minus minimum voltage. It's going to give you the, uh, basically the pressure per volt, or the KPA per volt. And you multiply that number by 5 and you're going to get the linear value. Um, and then to get the offset, you're going to take the max pressure, subtract that from the brackets uh, of linear times max voltage divided by 5, and it'll give you the offset. And it'll, it's, a lot of times that'll be a negative number. Nowadays we plug it in, it's no big deal. Uh, but it used to be an issue, uh, but not anymore. So we can we use negative numbers now. But this will give you the linear uh, value of that sensor. So um, good little formula to keep in your toolbox. Uh, so this this works um, to get your uh, linear and offset values in the two. All right, almost done. So um, IAT sensor. So the, for boosted applications, it's recommended to go ahead and move the IAT sensor to the intake manifold. Uh, that's because uh, pressure causes heat, so that's where the heat's going to be. So we want to go ahead and put the sensor in there to make sure uh, we're monitoring that. A lot of newer cars have just, uh, they already have that. It's called a map. Um, intercoolers. Uh, anytime we get the ITs down, uh, down, it's good. That's what we want to do. Uh, very good thing to run an intercooler uh, that allows for more boost. Uh, a little more, it gives you more uh, tolerance for uh, detonation and everything like that. So uh, that's good. And then uh, we get down to um, water meth. Uh, that's, that's another way of reducing chamber temperatures. Again, uh, it's also going to help with the detonation and tolerance of the base fuel. So uh, that's a good idea too. 
Uh, EGT sensors is not always not always a bad idea to go ahead and throw in some uh, exhaust gas temperature sensors uh, to monitor what's really going on in there. Very important for high, very high boost, very high nitrous uh, setups with um, complex fueling strategies and aggressive tunes. Probably, uh, if you're at that level already, you probably already have to set those in. Um, I would just say in there. Uh, so that way you can monitor if uh, your other strategies are working, like your intercooler or water meth, etc. Uh, pretty important to know if they're not uh, working as you, as intended. And uh, some some uh, teams even have them on each uh, each pipe, which is which is uh, pretty getting pretty serious if you're running like that. But uh, that's pretty much it. So I'll uh, move on to the conclusion here and uh, wrap this up. All right. I hope I hope that wasn't too long for y'all. I'm sorry for the length of this video. Um, it's a little long-winded, I know, but there was a lot to cover, and um, it's just not a, a simple subject to uh, really to really go go into uh, head first without kind of touching bases on all the basics which we just covered um, so the physics the boost and pressure compression fuel types octane spark I just basically covering all the bases here make sure before I make any further guides um, that we have a firm understanding of the knowledge base uh, built up uh, so we kind of understand what we're doing there's a lot more to every one of these uh, every one of these categories has a ton of other things I could have talked about but in the interest of keeping it short as possible um, I kind of just bas basically touched on each one just to make sure you're thinking about it um, so the information uh, that we learned is vital to understanding how to correct the problems that may that you might encounter during per tuning, so uh, as well as preventing them from occurring as well, like detonation and preignitions. It's impossible to go into every per possible engine combination out there and potential problems each of them may face. Uh, so base knowledge and continued research is key to successfully tuning a, a high performance engine. So you need that base knowledge that we just went over. Um, it's more important to understand why you're doing something than it is, than it is to just do it because someone said so. Um, I'm not, I don't want to be the guy just telling you to do stuff. I'd rather be teaching you why you're doing stuff. Uh, this does not mean the input from other tuners and builders is not valuable. However, uh, your own experience may suffer if, uh, if you don't know why uh, they do certain things the way they do it. Uh, so that, this is the base knowledge uh, that I'm trying to convey across uh, to get that base knowledge built up. Uh, additionally, because every other engine is different, this means that all of them come with a different set of instructions as to what works and what doesn't. So you can't just listen to basically anybody uh, out there um, following instructions because, uh, well, they all come with a different set of instructions because every engine is a snowflake. Uh, so especially when you start talking boost and, and all kinds of any other factors that could be applied, there's so many combinations, too many to cover, so that's why I wanted to go over the base um, knowledge instead of uh, doing a specific uh, tuning guide uh, on anything in particular so uh, hopefully you guys like this and, and if so uh, please uh, like and subscribe or uh, leave a comment um, if you have questions hit me up here on YouTube or over on LS1 Tech um, I'm also over on HP tuners uh, so uh, without I guess I uh, hope you like the video and uh, I guess I'll see you out there